So we want to discuss if you have a polar equation, generally we'll have equations in the form r equals some function of theta. So we have our radius as a function of theta. How can you figure out what the graph is? And sort of a related topic, if you look at this equation, can you identify what symmetries the graph should have um, so that you can tell whether or not your graph is correct in a way? So a little check on your graph. Once we get done with that, so we'll kind of talk about these two topics together, just graphing and looking at symmetries. Then we'll come back and do a little bit of calculus on polar equations. Very, very similar to what we did with calculus on parametric equations. In fact, we'll see that there's a nice tie between polar equations and parametric equations. So start off with, let's, let's, let's draw the graph. See how this fits the form r is some function of theta. Whenever you have that, in order to draw the graph, in Cartesian space, you should start off by making a graph that has theta on one axis and r on the other axis. Remember, the interpretation of theta is the direction that you're facing, and r is how far forward or backward that you walk from that point. Um, but what we'll do is we'll just graph sort of what's the relationship between r and the direction you're facing, and then we'll actually interpret it to create the graph in xy space. So we're going to look at the relationship in r theta space, then come back and, and interpret it so that we see the graph in xy space. So this is actually pretty helpful to sort of get the idea of it. So here's our first equation, r equals 1 plus cosine theta. Um, we know what the graph of cosine theta looks like. It starts up at 1 and then dips down and comes back up again by the time you've completed 2 pi, which is right here. So if you add 1 to that, it's just going to shift the graph up 1. So instead of at 0, normally you're at 1, but plus 1 makes 2 at pi halves, which is right here, you're going to have, normally you'd have 0, but you're going to have 1 because you're adding 1. At pi, usually you have negative 1, but if you add 1, then you're back up to 0. Uh, 3 pi halves, we're here, and okay, so this, if we fill this in with what we know about the graph of cosine, then this is the picture that we get. Oh, I missed a little bit, but um, okay, how's that? <clears throat> All right, so here's our graph. Now what we're going to do is we're going to use the information from this graph in order to get a sense of what the picture looks like over here. So first off, if you're facing an angle of 0, you walk out two steps. So facing an angle of 0 would be looking straight down the x-axis, and walking out two steps would put you here. So that's a point on the graph. Now let's go to this next point that we know, facing pi halves. Facing pi halves, you walk out 1. So that would indicate facing pi halves is looking straight up. Walking out a step 1 puts you there. Next easy point here. Um, facing pi, we have a radius of 0. So as we're looking out this way, as we're looking sort of due west, um, we have a radius of 0, so that puts a point right there. And facing 2 pi, let's see, well, let's see, I, I skipped a, an easy one here. At 3 pi halves, we have a radius of 1. So facing 3 pi halves is looking straight down. So with, if you're looking straight down and you take one step out, you end up here at the point 0, negative 1. So so far I've got four points on the graph. You can kind of see what's happening. If you imagine first, as you turn from 0 to pi halves, what happens is the radius slowly decreases. So as we're, as we're turning, we start out initially looking down this axis and we turn until we're looking straight up. As we do that, our radius gradually decreases. So we can imagine that what's going to happen here is we're going to see our radius get shorter and shorter the more we turn. So we can connect that up with kind of a smooth curve. We get the idea of this. Now what's going on here? Well, as we turn from, from, from pi halves to pi, so here's the point pi halves where we'd be looking straight up, and here's the point pi. As we do that, um, we see that the radius continues to get shorter and shorter until there is no radius. So you can imagine as you turn, you walk out less and less so that we see something like this. Okay, now as we turn from pi to 3 pi halves, you can think we are, our direction is changing from facing west to facing south, right? So back along the x-axis to straight down the y-axis, our radius gradually increases again. So we see something like this. And then as we finish off, turning from 3 pi halves to 2 pi, which is right here, you can see our radius gradually grows from 1 to 2. So we see as we turn, we are walking out further and further and further. And this gives us the graph of this function.
Now this graph actually has a little bit of symmetry to it. It has this symmetry. If you flip it over the x-axis, then um, it, the graph looks the same. So we, we already know from um, pre-calculus, when you learn to graph functions, how to identify symmetry when you have a Cartesian equation, an equation like y equals f of x. Um, now what we want to do is come up with how do you characterize um, the symmetry of, um, of polar equations. How are you going to recognize that they have those symmetries? Okay, just as a reminder, this, this is what you probably already know about symmetry. First off, symmetry about the x-axis. Well, when you studied functions like y equals f of x, those don't have any symmetry about the, y, the x-axis because if you had some graph here and you could flip it around the x-axis, then it automatically wouldn't be a function anymore, right? So you've never really looked at symmetry about the x-axis for the graph of a function. But you did look at symmetry about the y-axis before. So um, you found out that if f of negative x equals f of x, it means the function really doesn't know it's right from its left, right? It can't tell if you're at negative 2 or you're at 2. It can't tell if you're at 3 or negative 3. So that means anytime xy is a point on the graph, minus xy is also on the graph. So if you have a point over here at xy, you're going to have a corresponding point. If this is x, and this is the opposite value of a corresponding point there. Functions that have that property, whatever the whatever points over here is also over there, and so on. Like that right functions that have that property then have symmetry around the y-axis. You also studied symmetry about the origin. That that, remember, is that whenever there's a point here at some location xy, if you rotate 180 degrees around the origin, there's a corresponding point that's also on the graph at minus x minus y. Functions that have this kind of symmetry, we call them odd. They end up having this sort of rotational property. And this is how you test for it. Right. You, you plug in at negative x into the function and see if it simplifies to be the same thing as the opposite of the function. If so, you know that the function can't tell if you rotate 180 degrees. So another way of saying is that if xy is a point on the graph, minus x minus y also is a point on the graph. We're going to do something similar, come up with some tests that we can perform on a polar equation to see if it might have some symmetries. So if we look at our equation here, r equals 1 plus cosine theta, this one that we just graphed, um, we saw that it had x-axis symmetry. Now, how do you know that it has x-axis symmetry? Well, if you think about any point up here, um, if it did have x-axis symmetry, it would have to have a corresponding point down here. The relationship between these two points is this. So, you have this angle theta with this radius we have the opposite angle with the same radius. So if you're going to have um, x-axis symmetry, you'll have x-axis symmetry if r theta is a point on the graph. And so is um, r negative theta. Now, Remember, in polar, there's not, there are not unique representations of particular points. So that means there's not a unique test for those symmetries. So we can see, though, that this graph does have that, that particular symmetry, because if we try to replace, if we have a particular value of r and a particular value of theta that work for this equation, if we replace that theta with negative theta, remember, th cosine is an even function, so it absorbs that negative. So that means that um, if r and theta satisfy this equation, then, the, then you could always replace the theta with negative theta. You still get the same value for cosine. So in this case, r, r and theta and r and negative theta um, both are the same point. Now, there's another, there are many, many ways in which, in which you could have x-axis symmetry because there are many, many representations of points. There's, a, there's another way that you might end up having this symmetry, though there's another way that, that it can occur. And that would be, if you have this angle theta, then over here on the other side is the corresponding angle. So all the way over here is the angle pi minus theta. So we have this angle here, pi minus theta. So here's the angle theta. The angle pi minus theta just puts you over 
on the other side. So then if, you, if you're on the other side, if you go backwards, so if we're over at this angle, pi minus theta, if we go backwards r, then we would get to this point. So another test would be if instead of if r and theta are on the graph, if you can replace theta with pi minus theta and replace r with negative r, and that's also a point on the graph, then you know you have that symmetry. In this case, um, we can't do that, but that's okay. It does satisfy this one, and so we know it has to have that x-axis symmetry. Let's sum up. We've, we've come up with um, a way of graphing. We, we graph the function in r theta space, and then we interpret theta as the direction to face, and r as the distance to walk out. Um, we have a test now. If we happen to notice that in our function, replacing r and theta with r and negative theta won't affect the function, then we know it has x-axis symmetry. It's also possible that replacing theta with pi minus theta and r with negative r, if that doesn't affect the function, if whenever this is a point on the graph, so is negative r pi minus theta, then it's going to have this x-axis symmetry.